Uh, could you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to draw your attention particularly to the last few words of chapter 1. There's um, the last two verses particularly of chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 35. <coughs> so this, <coughs> this isn't the beginning of a new series of messages, really, but there are, just, there are two uh, verses, uh, in, one in 1 Corinthians and one in 2 Corinthians, and I thought over this week and next week we might look at these two verses because uh, in these verses Paul is uh, basically repeating the same thing but he's doing it from, from different angles and uh, both of them are quite amazing and mind-blowing and, and very helpful to us if we dig into them a bit so at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 30 and 31 and this is what the word of God says But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. The other verse, which we'll think about probably next week, is found at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, I'll just read it for you. You probably know this verse pretty well. It's verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now these are two wonderful, wonderful statements uh, that we find here in the Bible. And just remember the background to these, especially this first letter to the Corinthians and remember that really what he's doing in the first letter to the Corinthians at least for a large part of it is he's rebuking the Corinthians he calls them a church at the beginning uh, he says that they are saints he believes that they're Christians he refers to them as Christians but some of their ideas and some of their behaviour has fallen far short of what should be standard for a Christian. And so he's got some rebukes for them. And what a lot of it boils down to is their pride. And they really did have a problem with this. They had a problem with being proud about their gifts and they had a problem with being proud about their preachers. Um, They'd been blessed with a number of preachers. Apollos, Paul etc. And <clears throat> there was a, a sort of a party spirit uh, as well in this church. So this is a, a letter really of, a, of Paul writing as a pastor to this church in Corinth and he's addressing especially this idea of pride. Pride in themselves, pride in themselves as Christians, as the Corinthian Christians. And so what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to, he's wanting to address that. And the way he does that is he gets them to start to think uh, about God and their own salvation and what's been involved in that salvation and who's been involved in that salvation. And so here in the very first chapter and at the end, he comes to them and he makes these statements. And he sort of is cutting the ground away from under them when it comes to their own pride in things and he says to them but, but and this is true for every one of us who is a Christian today remember that this is true for me and for you every one of you if you're a believer today but of him but of him you are in Christ Jesus and that statement alone is a fantastic statement just think about that just mull it over in your mind the implications of that. What he's saying. So I'm a Christian today. Wonderful. Fantastic. What a glorious and wonderful uh, profession to be able to make. What a, what a <coughs> wonderful state to be in. To be a Christian. To be born again. To have your sins forgiven. And to be now included in the children of God. And to be a saint. And to be on your way to heaven. But of him of him you are in Christ Jesus 
Nobody else. Nobody else can take the credit. Nobody else can claim to have had, uh, to have been the author of this. Nobody else can claim to have had a part in it. Of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us, <coughs> excuse me, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. <coughs> <clears throat> so what he's doing is he's confronting them with God and he's saying now God, God's in the business of humbling us and God's in the business of saving us and God has this amazing plan and purpose and it's all God's work from beginning to end the salvation of sinners and now you Corinthians you can't stand there and be proud because of the sovereignty of God in salvation so this is going to leave the Corinthians convicted. It's going to confront them. It's going to encourage them to put, uh, to, put to death that pride and to glory only in the Lord. <coughs> um, but what I want to do out of this is just draw out a few lessons for us, a few helpful practical lessons from these statements this morning. And... Um, each one of them we could, uh, I guess we could spend a bit of time on, but we'll just go through them and um, fairly rapidly and, and make some comment on each one. The implications of what he's saying to us. He says, of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and redemption and sanctification uh, and righteousness. Now, really, at the end of that list, th there isn't anything left that needs to be added in any way at all to the explanation and to the, and, and to the character of your salvation. But one of the lessons is this, the centrality of Christ. The centrality of Christ. Now, we must... We must not just pay lip service to this. This is meant to be a, a doctrine and a truth which is important for us in our everyday personal life. And it's a challenge to us, and God is challenging us, even as he's challenged me, about this. You see, it's all about Christ Jesus. There's nowhere else to look. Nothing came from anywhere else or through anybody else. None of these things which are listed here, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, none of those things are found anywhere else. And none of them are imparted or communicated or given to me or to you uh, through anyone else. Now that's as, true, that's as true when you were converted and it's as true today as you live out your Christian life. And he's underlining the fact that it is all centred in Jesus Christ. It's all found in Jesus Christ. And if it's all found in Jesus Christ, and if Jesus Christ is the centre in terms of the plan of salvation, your salvation, then that needs to be applied in my life and your life. And Jesus Christ needs to be kept central in my life and my thinking. Now we're not talking, uh, we're not talking about just a theory or a doctrine here. And the loss of this, if we lose this, we, we've lost the heart of our Christian life. If we lose this dimension of making Christ central and thinking as we go through life, and then acting on the thinking as we go through life, that Christ is everything to me now, today, even as he was in my conversion. Everything that I need, everything that I, I'm going to need for this day, for this week. All the resources, the spiritual resources, the grace that I need, the, 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 the strength that I need, the wisdom that I need, whatever it might be, it's, it's communicated to me it's coming to me 
through my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the loss of this centrality of Christ is a terrible loss. Now, if we lost this when we went to church, if we lost this in the preaching that we received in church, hopefully we'd be up in arms about it and we'd be aware of it. Hopefully we would be clear enough that the business of what a preacher or a pastor is supposed to be on about, Paul has said this, remember in the reading we read it, is he's got to preach Christ. He's got to preach Christ. That's the only thing. He says, look, when I went to, the, to you in Corinth, I only had one idea. Well, I didn't come with a bag full of sermon outlines and a, and a whole plan of doctrine. I didn't come with an elaborate, worked out confession of faith as such. I came to you, I came to you, he says, in fear and trembling, and I came to you with one agenda, with one message, with, with, with one plan in my mind of what I was going to preach. I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified. Now, obviously, preaching Christ and Him crucified is going to be uh, fill. I mean, you could fill a, a ministry. You could fill years and years of ministry with doing that. But you get the point. The loss of the centrality of Christ. It's a great loss. We'd recognise it in preaching. We'd recognise it in doctrine. And we wouldn't be happy about it. And we shouldn't be happy about it. But we've got to make sure that we recognise it in our own life. We mustn't lose that. We mustn't lose that orientation, if you like. So, here he is. He's the risen Saviour. He's my shepherd. He's by my side every day. He's a faithful friend. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I, I must communicate with him. I must walk with him. I must talk with him. I must love him. I must tell him I love him. And I must listen to him. And I must consult him. He's a real living saviour. He's a good shepherd. And he's got to be central in my life. In my thinking. And my life practically. Now, the next little thing about this is also very important. You see, what the verses is telling us is that very deliberately these things which we, of which we had none, right? We had none of these things. We had no wisdom from God. We were the fools before we were Christians. We were the fools who said in their heart, there is no God. We had no wisdom from God. We had no righteousness. We might have thought we did, but we didn't. We didn't have a righteousness that was going to measure up and stand the test of God's standard. And we didn't, certainly we didn't have sanctification. That's a translation of a word which often gets simply translated as holiness. We didn't have that. We didn't have that in and of ourselves. We could have lived a thousand years and we would never have had those things in and of ourselves. As wise or as diligent or as hard working or as good as we might have been. We never would have been able to manufacture these things. We never would have been able to, to produce them in a way that was the standard of, of, God's, of God's requirement and God's judgment. And we didn't have redemption. So all these things have been given to us. They've been given to us, but they've come wrapped up in a person. Let's never forget this. This is highly, highly, highly personal. The Christian life is all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. It's about being made a friend, being, being moved from being an enemy, being an enmity with God and, and the offence and the wall of offence. He writes about these things to the Corinthians, remember? That's taken away. And we have been reconciled to God. It's framed so often in personal terms. So this is very personal. Salvation has a very personal nature to it a very personal character to it because salvation is wrapped up in a person it's because that person 
has taken your place. That's the only reason you're saved today. It's because that person has has lived a righteous life and died a substitutionary death and because of that person, Jesus Christ. That's why God, in his wisdom and his mercy and his grace, said, my son needs to actually go down into this sin-sick, broken world. And he needs to be born as a person, as a human being, as a man, so that he can take the place of the sinners on whom I set my love. And so, you see, from beginning to end, it's personal. So, we must never lose the personal nature of our salvation. The personal nature of all of these things coming to us in Jesus Christ himself. So I'm, I, I can't claim any of these things for myself other than that they have been given to me and worked in me through Jesus Christ. His love for me. His death on my behalf. And then his rising again, going back to his Father and then lo and behold him saying, with his Father, well now I'll send my Spirit. I won't leave you comfortless. Now I will send my Spirit and he'll inhabit your heart. But it will be the Spirit of God and he'll dwell within you. And there's that personal nature to it. The third thing that we can glean from these verses is very obviously the sovereignty of God in salvation. I mean, you can't miss that. Um, and he's, he's deliberately emphasising this because he's trying to get across to the Corinthians that they shouldn't take credit for either their salvation or their so-called achievements or their blessings since they've become Christians, especially their spiritual gifts, which, you'll get on to, which he gets on to later. And so he says, but it's all from God. It's of him you are in Christ Jesus. And what's he doing? He's underlining this truth that when it comes to your salvation it's a result of the sovereign will and purpose and plan of God. It's not a result of my effort and it's not a result of your effort at all. It's not, it's not me who has put me in Christ. It's God who has put me. It's God the Father who has put me in Christ. It's he from the beginning who worked in us, convicted us, uh, opened our eyes, opened our ears, regenerated us by his spirit, granted us repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, called us out of our darkness into his light and so on. So he's simply underlining this. Now this isn't to negate human responsibility at all. Of course, Human responsibility is clearly taught in the scripture, right alongside the sovereignty of God in salvation. And it's as much an important truth as the sovereignty of God is. And the way it's presented is so often like that. And so you can say with all the authority of the scriptures to anyone, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. How is that possible to say that and, and, and reconcile that with the sovereignty of God in salvation? Only God can save sinners. You can't save yourself. But yet the Bible says, repent and believe. Put your trust in the word of God. Well, you know the scriptures don't make any attempt to reconcile those things to your satisfaction and my satisfaction. They just put them out there. And they expect you to believe them and commit to them both 100%. To believe 100% in the sovereignty of God in salvation. That is his work, his doing from beginning to end. But at the same time, to believe 100% in the reality of the responsibility of sinners to repent, to hear the gospel, repent, and put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Now, I say we can't reconcile those things. Not those two things. Not to the satisfaction of our puny, finite minds. 
We just see that they're in the scriptures. And sometimes, for example, John 6 is a classic example. You'll find the Lord Jesus who will say in the same sentence and sometimes almost in the same breath something which emphasizes the sovereignty of God in salvation and in the very next breath something that emphasizes the human responsibility of man. No man can come to me unless the Father draw them. Believe. And if you don't believe, you're, you're already under condemnation. And so on. But here, he's particularly emphasizing the sovereignty of God. But he's got an angle on it. And the angle on it is this. It's, it's, it's what we might call <laughs> the, the, um, the gratuity of it all. The graciousness of it all. He's not just telling you that you're, you're in Christ because of God's sovereignty, just in a cold sort of way at all. What he's, what he's trying to emphasize here is the sheer grace of that. It's, it's something that God's done in, in, in such grace and mercy. Of him you are in Christ Jesus. It's, it's a wonderful demonstration of his grace and his mercy. There's no explanation for it. There's no explanation given here for it other than the fact that God loves sinners. Why? Why am I today in Christ Jesus if I am? Why are you today in Christ Jesus? What explains that? Oh, you say the sovereignty of God. Well, hang on a minute, but what explains that? What explains why God, if God is sovereign, what explains why God used his sovereignty in that way in my life and in your life what explains that and of course the answer is the only answer is the grace of God the love of God the sheer unmitigated mercy and grace and favour and kindness and love of God and he's saying that and he's saying it at the same time as you're hearing all this, of course, you're being convicted about the, the impotence of man and the ignorance of man. He's, he's saying, effectively, you can't do these things for yourself. You haven't got these things. Wisdom, sanctification, righteousness and redemption. You say, wait a minute, I have, no, you haven't got them. Well, why haven't I got them? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with my wisdom? And what's wrong with my righteousness? I reckon I've got a bit of righteousness. What's wrong with it? And sanctification. Well, he said, you, you, you're talking foolishly. He, he's really saying, you, you, haven't, you haven't got it. It's only available in Christ. You haven't got it. Whatever you think you have got, you haven't got that which saves, that saving provision of those things which come only through Christ because they only really are in their fullness in Christ. And so, um, you can think of these things. One other lesson, one other thing that we might glean from this is how... Wisdom um, is personified in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I don't know whether you've ever thought of this when you've read the book of Proverbs. And if you read the book of Proverbs and you start to read about wisdom, and then at different places in, in the Proverbs, wisdom gets spoken of as a person. And I wonder if you've ever wondered about that. And one of the explanations for that, one of the right interpretations for that, is that Jesus Christ is wisdom personified. He is wisdom. He is, uh, he is God's wisdom, if you like. And he is wisdom from God. He's an expression. He's a, a, a living, breathing, walking, ministering, preaching, dying expression of God's wisdom. He is the Word of God, the living Word of God. And so He is the wisdom that has come out of God's mouth. But He's, he's 
wisdom personified. He's a faithful guide. He's a faithful shepherd. You may listen to him with a hundred percent confidence. You may cast yourself upon him. You may call out to him. You may seek him and seek answers from him and seek help from him. And where would you find this wisdom? Well, obviously in the scripture. In the scripture. And the scripture, what's the scripture about? Well, he himself said a couple of times at least, it's all about me. Christ in all the scriptures. So think of this. Next time you're, you're struggling with a decision, with a, with a problem, seeking the will of God, wanting wisdom, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's wisdom personified. You may walk like him, walk in his way, put your footsteps, put your feet in his footsteps, follow him, hear him, know him, you see. But then finally we must say something about the order of the words because the order of the words is, is, is um, really interesting uh, and I guess what they're adding up to is that you're left with an understanding that sal- the fullness of the salvation that has been accomplished for you and so he's giving you this, this list He just doesn't say you are in Christ Jesus. He tells you how this has been accomplished and what's what's actually been involved with it, what it actually means. That he, Christ, has become for you. Think of the condescension in this. Think of the stepping down uh, for you, a sinner. Think of, I mean, just think of that. That's an amazing thought. That he's become for us. How, who are we to deserve this? He has become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. My dear friend, if you like, that, that's, your, that's your spiritual biography. That, that's your Christian life story. Wisdom from, when the wisdom from God came to you in the gospel, you heard the gospel. You heard the gospel, the gospel message about Christ being divine and living and being perfect and dying in your place and rising again. And um, the gospel came to you in the power of the Spirit. And if you're a Christian today, it came to you and you believed it. And in believing it, you were justified. You were saved. And the wisdom of God. And that gospel carried to you a righteousness from God which you didn't have, but which you needed and you had to have if you were ever going to stand before the judgment of God one day and be able to enter heaven. That righteousness came, even as he says in Romans chapter 1, in the gospel message. A righteousness from God is revealed, which is by faith from first to last. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And so, you you were justified by faith. See? And then sanctification. And that's the rest of your life as a Christian. The Holy Spirit working in you and growing you and sanctifying you and making me and you more like the Lord Jesus. And then redemption. Well, why is redemption at the end of the list? Well, because Christ's redemption is so full and perfect and complete that he didn't just redeem your soul, He's redeemed your body. And you will be raised one day with a new body. Because the price that has been paid is such an amazingly full and perfect price. He's redeemed the totality of who you are. Not only your soul, but soul and body. And one day you will inhabit heaven with a new body, a resurrected body. Think of this very letter, 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about it, you know. Uh, it, goes, it, it goes into the ground, a, a mortal body, but it's raised up an imperishable body. It goes as an earthly body, it's raised as a heavenly body. And so that redemption is full and free and complete. So having said all that, what's, what's the bottom line, if you like? 
what's the point what's the main application well he says in light of this if you're going to boast if you're going to glory glory in the Lord glory in the Lord be so taken up be consumed by the goodness and the love and the greatness and the wonder and the blessing of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus we really have something to glory about and it's not nothing about us it's about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus it's glorying in him glorying in that glorying in his son you see this verse is a verse that could have just been written for the first question of the shorter catechism or let me put it that's the wrong way around to put that let me put it like this the first question of the shorter catechism could have just been written for this verse what is it? what is the chief end of man? the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever and here in these verses is all the fuel all the fuel you'll ever need for glorifying God and enjoying God forever Amen let's pray our Heavenly Father thank you thank you for your Son thank you for your salvation thank you for providing so fully and freely wonderfully and Father help us to glory in the Lord not just in, in, in the sense of of being unashamed to say we're Christians and to seek to share the gospel but to be filled with in our own souls and spirits to be filled with an excitement and a gratitude and, and an amazement and a joy about how wonderful the Lord is and he's our Lord he's my Lord, he's my saviour what a wonderful thing I can't think of anything in my own life in comparison with that that would be worth boasting about but that, that's something worth glorifying you for and glorying in so help us to do that this week we pray it in Jesus name Amen